And welcome into Poke the Bear episode 114. That is Connor Ryan. I'm Evan Marinovsky. Connor, it is a fun week. This is the first Poke the Bear we're doing. This is the first podcast we're doing inside training camp. It is a great time to talk hockey with you, Evan. Thank God we are done with we are done with the summer. We're done with the discourse over uh, the draft and free agency and talking about Bergeron and Krejci coming back and talking about the discourse with coaching. Thank God we can finally, it, I, the moment of bliss I felt when I was able to tweet out the lines again and, and let people know what was going on in training camp, warmed my heart, Evan. Warmed my heart. It warmed my heart just to see you back there. It was not just, a, you know, the, the lines are great, but just to see you and the rest of the media back at, to see you guys all there and tweeting. It's, uh, it's, it's great for the fans to see. Uh, fortunately, coaching discourse, there, there, there are teams, there are other teams in the market with a little more of coaching discourse. Uh, uh, the, the, the team next door, I think they're the Boston Celtics. Uh, they've got something going on over there. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite the eventful day, Evan. Yeah. The first, first full day of on ice skating for the Bruins. And I think we are getting pushed a little bit further down <laughs> the, uh, the the headlines, I would say. There's some bigger probably, things going for, on. Uh, probably good reason, too. Uh, I think yeah. there's yeah a lot more going on with the team that uh, the Bruins share the garden with, to say the least. So. Yes, yes. Fortunately, uh, Bruins do not have any situations like that. Let's see. That seems like quite a situation uh going on over there which uh you know boston sports journal has lots of coverage on that clns has coverage on that so make sure you go follow it there we're not really gonna be your experts on uh we're, we're not gonna keep speculating on the Ime udoka stuff we'll, we'll send out funny tweets we'll send out funny tweets but we will not uh dive into that on here uh because the bruins actually had some big news this week aside from training camp it wasn't just training camp it wasn't just Ime udoka's shenanigans uh Zdeno Chara retired uh, after 25 years in the NHL felt like it was coming uh just given that he hadn't signed anywhere he said he was gonna make a decision in the fall um Matt Porter caught him walking around bright uh walking around outside the practice facility um forgot how tall and just crazy Chara looks it's insane um but done in the NHL Definitely nice to see him retire a Bruin, technically speaking. Um, the legacy. I, I, there's a lot. There's been a lot said, and I think, like I was, I was on Garrett Hayden's podcast uh, or earlier this week, and and I was like, I feel like we've had all these talks before because we we had these same conversations when he left initially. Um, but the legacy. I mean, what what's your kind of big takeaway from a guy like Chara? Yeah, I, I think for a guy that in terms of his profile and his strengths of his game was such a unique player in terms of just being a a, a unicorn, right? In terms of being a guy who's six nine, uh, you know, th- that size and the ability to move like that to be a guy that's not just there's been plenty of other big bodied behemoths that are, you know, on a blue line that are just out there to smash people around. To have a guy like Chara who uh, could be a, a shutdown guy was arguably the best shutdown guy in the league for years and years. Um, you know, it's almost criminal that only won one Norris in terms of just how good he was. And I think how maybe underrated he was at the top of his game, but to incorporate the offense and then the leadership, it takes a special player. I think to when his career is over, um, you look at their impact off the field, the diamond, the, the ice, almost you know it's almost as if not more important than what their contributions were on there and i think when you look at chara of course you look at him and uh the fact that he was a pillar of that defense for over a decade a guy you could rely on um without his play on the ice he would not have won the cup in 2011 but beyond that it's just i think why people view chara as probably one of the best if not the best free agent signings ever is that he completely changed the culture, right? He didn't just represent, I think for Bruins fans coming off that 05 season where you're kind of stuck in this rudderless, awful no man's land. You traded Joe Thornton. He didn't just offer hope in terms of like, all right, maybe we can bounce back. He took that and became more than just a new franchise star. He changed the culture completely. And it's it's a testament, I think to him and the work he did in terms of, you know, stressing accountability of communication of, you know, mutual respect for guys, not having clicks in the, the locker room. It's a testament to him that I think it's endured and carried on. You know, you see it with guys like Bergeron now, and they'd always talk about that. It's, it feels like every time when a guy arrives to the Bruins, be it free agency or trade, 
first thing they talk about is it's known around league circles of the culture in Boston of guys like Chara and, and Bergeron and how they kind of hold court in the room and how people are very welcoming. And I think that all starts back with a guy like Chara uh, and to have a guy like him who, you know, gets, he signs that big deal at the time in the summer of 06 and is someone that, you know, signs that and wants to be a star player here in Boston, wants to be a captain, but then to, you know, put the onus on him to be like, I'm not just going to be a franchise savior or a guy that's going to, you know, people are going to buy my Jersey. I'm going to augment and change the fabric of this organization. Uh, that's a special athlete. And it's someone that the Bruins are damn lucky. They had, uh, you know, arrived that summer because this whole state of this franchise, not just the, the Stanley cup in 2011, but the whole state of this franchise and the culture built would be drastically different. If Charles signed elsewhere uh, during oh, that summer. Oh, he's one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, that they have been winners ever since. I will say another interesting thing, because I agree with all that. Another interesting thing is, you know, talk about, you know, coming in, balls on the table, says, I want to be the captain. And then was, and again, this is more Dave Lewis, but that first year was awful. Yeah. Like 06, 07, what was he, a minus 20 or minus 28? Something I like mean, that. Yeah. He, it was terrible. I mean, he didn't fight. Like, the, the, the significance was so low. And the fact that it got back on track after, and I know obviously a lot that had a lot to do with the new coach with Claude and everything, but like that could have easily derailed a lot of guys that could have completely just ruined it. I mean, a guy who wants to come in, as you said, be captain, change the whole organization that 06, 07 year could have been debilitating for most guys. It wasn't for him. And I always find that fascinating that it, it really couldn't have got off to a worse start and he got the train back on the tracks. And I always found that fascinating because usually with a free agent, if the first season's really bad, it's an indication of not many good things to come. And I think the fact that he was able to reroute it and just, you know, again, chart a course that has been um, unprecedented around the league. I mean, this is a, you know, the conversation of they should have won more cups. We'll get into, I think later on as, you know, when Bergeron and Krejci officially hang it up, I think we'll have that conversation. Um, but again, the fact that I don't think there's any team aside from maybe the Penguins or the Caps that's been this good for this long, consistently in the mix that good. And again, the Cups thing is something I think we will get to later on. But even just 2011, I mean, just a just a, a hero for that team. Um, and again, you won't see anything like him ever again, most likely. You won't. You just, again, once in a generation. The guy who's 6'10 shows up. Yeah, 6'10. Right? <laughs> I love the picture of Charles with Shaq. Uh, yes. Th it's because that's the first time I've ever seen Charles look short. Yes. Uh, like, you know. But also, I, I think it was uh, Mr. Tencrad on Twitter who tweeted the picture of uh, Chara tackling Sweeney. Uh, yes. I can't believe that took all that time. That I never knew that existed. Um, yeah, that'll be a great tweet. If, if Char ever gets hired as assistant GM, it'll be like, you know, Char preventing Sweeney from signing, you know, Nick Foligno to another seven year deal, you know, like, don't, don't do it. So, uh, any the, the speculation meme, the memes just write themselves, don't they, Evan? Well, the best, maybe the other best Char picture is the one Feidelberg got it. It was the one of, uh, or it like got sent to him. Oh, the Char Canopy at Lake. Canopy Lake Park. <laughs> I mean, one of the most devastatingly <laughs> depressing photos ever. Like not even, it's not even on a good ride. It's not on the Yankee no. Cannon ball he's on no. the boston teapot he's on the little little rooster thing flying around it's not fun especially no. if you're six nine and you yeah, just lost in it. <laughs> and you just lost the stanley cup like the night before so not great was not, not great. it's very sad but we're if it, we're a pretty pro canopy like park uh park podcast of course too, typically we've always been Man, we're not besmirching them here we're no. just saying you know it's not maybe at the same level as some of the all time that doesn't untamed. mean I'm gonna, it was yeah, no untamed no, no of course not but you know what hey who are we to judge? We're not here to besmirch Canopy Lake. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, but yeah, again, Chara, just an outstanding player. And uh, again, lots lots of cool stories, lots to be said about him. And uh, again, I mean, what do you think he ends up doing? What's the, what do you think he, what, what's your speculation? Yeah, we would not be surprised if he gets into operations some respect. I don't think he's going to be like the strength and conditioning coach. I think there's probably people who uh, are probably more qualified in terms of like, you know, studying it and, and all that stuff, but he's, he's a guy intense. that, yeah, he's, he's a, well, he's a guy that, you know, you look at his overall resume beyond just hockey. He's got like a, like a secret agent thing, right. Where he's going like to speak seven languages. Dude, like has biked stages of the tour de France. He climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Like I wouldn't put any real estate license, on what he wants to do real estate license. Like I wouldn't, 
don't put any ceiling in terms of what he can do or what he wants to do. Um, so whether that's, you know, becoming eventually like player development um, where, I mean, even for a guy like him and just how he's not, you know, he's known for his size, obviously, but it wasn't just the only defining characteristic of his game. So if it's kind of following the, the, what Chris Kelly did, where it's development into coaching or development and then going into GM or assistant GM or anything like that, there's plenty of different avenues he can take. And I wouldn't put it past him charting one of those different paths to get somewhere in the Bruins organization. Yeah, Chara feels big. And I don't mean like physically big, obviously Chara is big, but he, I, I almost feels he feels bigger than, and I'm not saying I'm not like besmirching those roles, but he feels more like a, like a president or, or a, or a team owner, like somehow getting involved in ownership of a team, maybe not the Bruins even like, but I, it just feels bigger than that. Now, again, he could easily be an assistant GM or a GM. Those are big jobs, which I, I could absolutely see him in, but he feels like a, like an ownership type, really smart guy, sets a tone. Like I could absolutely see him being someone teams are after, whether it be the Bruins or somebody else. And I, again, it should be the Bruins. I would hope he's somehow involved with them because I think he would be terrific and continue kind of that culture that he instilled back in like 2006. So uh, interesting stuff, interesting stuff. I'll, he'll also have his brand, which he's been kind of <laughs> building. So that'll be another thing that he probably stays involved with. Um, anyways, on to this Bruins team. On to this Bruins team. Uh, again, day one is in the books of training camp. We're recording after. Um, and Jim Montgomery's spoken now twice in uh, the past two days. And one thing I found interesting from his first press conference uh, well, on, on Wednesday was he was talking, and, and, and he's been pretty open about how he views his top six. And I found it very interesting that you know, he, 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 he mentioned the top six and what it will probably be and hopes it be, hopes it is. And then he was asked about the third line. Uh, Steve Conroy said, you know, is it going to be, you know, Frederick Coyle and Smith? And he said, well, I don't want to commit to any lines or anything like that. I kept thinking to myself, huh, you just kind of committed to a top six. So what it makes clear to me is I don't think that third line's guaranteed. I don't think it's a guarantee that Frederick Coyle and Smith are together. Um, and I think that's might be a spot where there's, room for guys to slot in in training camp that might be a spot that rotates through the first you know month or two of the year uh what do you think of that and and is there anything been anything else of montgomery that you've you've found quite interesting yeah uh, i think it's something where you look at the side of camp and montgomery kind of mentioned it that those first days is about kind of i think setting the the tone and delivering the message in terms of what the expectations are for the two plus three ish weeks of, of camp and what to expect. So if you're a guy like Craig Smith or Trenton Frederick, where you go into the, being like, all right, well, I played most of last year in the third line. If I just, you know, go through the the usual motions or go through what I did well last year, I'm, I'm good in that spot. If you're a Montgomery and you're kind of setting down that edict of they're not committing to anything there on that third line yet, it again, puts the pressure on you. We talk a whole lot about that fourth line and the amount of, open swatch there are and even though guys like Felino and no six seem to be at the top of the list you've got Beecher and McLaughlin and Steen and all these other players but if a guy like McLaughlin or even a guy like Lysel you know pop during scrimmages or during these preseason games I don't think you know based on what Montgomery has said they're they're going to be like well he's still pretty young so I don't think I'm gonna you know bump out an established veteran I, just, I think it's all gonna come down to how the guys perform during this camp. Uh, I think when you've got Montgomery um, and kind of a fresh set of eyes there beyond just the clean slate that comes with a new uh, season of hockey, um, it seems like it's something where he's, he's focusing on identifying the best possible players uh, to put in these spots. So I think for him to say that at the start of camp, definitely I think kind of sends along that message that no spot is safe, that even though, as you said, Montgomery, last month pretty much talked about that top six. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but like sells skating with Bergeron to open the open camp, right? Like I, I Fireworks. Think, yeah, I think it's something where um, we have a good inkling, I think of what most of the lineup will look like, but I don't think they're, they're putting it, you know, they're, they're writing that in with permanent ink, right? It's going to be all right. Like probably on the outside looking in, but hell, let's put him in the top six, see how he does. Like, maybe he'll prove us wrong. So I think to, to have that approach where it's like, all right, I think we have a, a good idea, but we'll, you know, put it in the hands of these players, put them in situations where they should be able to succeed. And if they, you know, exceed our expectations, 
who's to say they're not going to secure a starting spot once we get to the middle of October? So uh, the biggest uh, news in Boston on Thursday had nothing to do with Ime Odoka. It was actually Fabian Lysel skating with Patrice Bergeron. Now, there, there needs to be some prefaces here, right? This is the yes. preface, okay? It was Group A. And Group A and B are not divided typically by, like, you know, the A team and the B team. Yes. It's just kind of, you know, they split the lineup. It's not anything crazy. It's not like they're ranking Fabian Lysel over David Pasternak and David Grinch. That's not how it, how it's done. Because I heard on the Sports Hub, they were doing, um, they were talking, they're like, oh, Fabian Lysel's playing with Bergeron. And I was like, well, yes, but, yes, but there's, there's a thing you're forgetting to mention there. Yeah, um, also, so- I, I want to say Group A also, uh, Taylor Hall is skating with Jack Sidnika and Mark McLaughlin. So I don't think that's going to be happening either. So you don't? it's exciting. Is, it's exciting. It's wild. Yes. Let's, let's pump the Temper. brakes just a little bit here. But Day at the same camp. time, let's, let's geek out a little bit. Let's geek out. Cause you know, every Bruins fan, every Bruins media member, everyone kind of wants to see Lysel with Bergeron because it's exciting. It's the next generation meeting the current one. Um, is there anything to it? Yeah, I mean, when you listen to what Jim Montgomery said on Wednesday about kind of what he's looking for in camp and what their strategy is, it does seem like, especially early on when they're starting to get a gauge on a lot of these younger players that, listen, I think Jim Montgomery, he hasn't coached the Bruins before. He has a good idea of what to expect from a guy like Patrice Bergeron. There's some guys you know what to expect. Yeah, there's some guys I don't think he has to really worry about. EA Sports doesn't, but uh, that is that is that that is a topic for another podcast. That's for sure. But um, I I think when you look at uh, what their focus is, it's these other guys, the guys like Lysel, uh, Beecher uh McLaughlin um even guys like maybe Zaka who you know how they fit into the the rotation now um I think early on it's something that Montgomery said is they want to incorporate a lot of younger players next to veterans not just to you know see how they do in certain situations like Lysel is not going to I think during camp be skating on the fourth line or he's going to be skating on a line with uh guys that are going to be third or fourth line grinders in Providence, Thomas right? Nosek and Nick Felino. Yeah, like I don't think that's going to be the case. They want to see even if uh Lysel's not ready or he's going to get sent back down to Providence eventually, they want to see what he can do during this uh limited time they have. You know, they're not going to be testing this out I don't think in uh February and March when they're getting ready to, you know, get to the final stretch of the regular season. Like now is the time to see how an offensively gifted guy like Lysel can do in these roles. And Montgomery also said, it's not just the fact that that gives an opportunity on the ice, but just sticking a guy like Lysel, who maybe if it's not this year, figures to be someone that's going to be part of the equation for this team, hopefully years to come. What better way to kind of ingratiate yourself into the, the system and the organization than being kind of attached to Bergeron's hip? for most of the first few weeks of camp. Like it's, you can see where they're coming from in terms of how they want to mix and match other guys in that lineup. Same with, I think Johnny Beecher, who uh, I think we'll talk about in a, a minute. He was with Felino. Like again, Felino's a, a guy who's been around the blocks, been in the league for a while. What better way to kind of learn the game, I think, than having him there as opposed to Beecher with guys that he could be playing with in Providence in a, a couple of months, right? Yeah, it's all about seeing how these kids do with the current guys that you have. I mean, again, like as the season goes along, if Jake DeBrus gets injured, if if there is less production on the top line or something like that, and Lysel does get brought in, now it, it's a good thing that you had training camp to sort of see how he did with a guy like Patrice Bergeron. And I think, again, everybody, and obviously Marshan's not participating, but it would be really cool to see Marshan, Bergeron, and Lysel. That would be, I think everybody's dream would be to see those three together. Um, just given that, I mean, I remember even this summer, there were times when we were saying to each other, hey, you know, this might, this, th- th- that might be the best trio you could put together for a first line, especially given uh, Lysel's, you know, his, his, his future. Um, but again, temper our expectations. Not, we've said this all along. Don't get too far ahead of ourselves, all those types of things. Um, but anyways, uh, the biggest match, biggest matchup. Uh, going on right now might not be you know the, the the UFC fights of the world the boxing matchups football matchups it might be Johnny Beecher versus Tomas Nosek for the fourth line center spot I mean this is they come to blows uh, but it is an interesting conundrum the Bruins have because on one hand you have a you know what you're going to get well-paid veteran fourth line center in Thomas Nosek who is fine not amazing 
not bad, but fine. And you have Johnny Beecher, your former first round pick fast, all the attributes, just pretty young and, you know, isn't a veteran. Um, what do you see being the future of those two going after each other? And by after each other, I mean like fighting for a spot, not like physically running after each other in the locker room with the hockey sticks. Yeah. I think going into camp, I would probably put Beecher in the same spot as someone like Lysel, where I don't think they're, they're saying definitively if they're not going to make the NHL roster, anything can happen. If these guys go and light it up during preseason action, more than I uh, willing to force the Bruins hand in that regard. But you kind of look at the way that the Sweeney and Montgomery are talking about Beecher, the opportunities that he's getting again, first few days of camp. So we don't want to run wild with speculation, but I think to see Beecher with guys that are probably making the NHL roster and Felino and DeBrusque in group E, it's kind of like what we saw last year where uh, Chris Wagner was in the equation, but he was skating with like Providence guys. You're like, is he, on the outside looking in. And then you look at today, I think Nosek was with, um, I think it was Joe Abate and Vinny Letary, like guys that I wouldn't probably put in that equation. And who knows? It could be we get to the preseason game one and Nosek scores two goals and Beecher kind of is a no-show and they can change that whole dynamic. But when you listen to what Sweeney said uh, on Wednesday in terms of, the ability to impact the game beyond scoring, um, even though he also said that they think that Beecher has a level he can get to. Again, I don't think he's going to be a 20 goal scorer, but if he can be someone that gives you 10 goals and 25, goals <laughs> yeah, yeah, 10 goals and 25 points, 30 points, and is your 4C, a lot of value there. Montgomery kind of talked about that they like uh, Nosek, not just. Uh, not no sick, uh, Beecher because he's very good at draws. Um, was good in Providence last year, brings value there. You know, it's more than just, I think, as much as Bruins fans focus on just the scoring with Beecher, I think when you look at his overall game and how advanced it maybe is at this stage, it does make him a guy that it, it's not just something where he's a project they want to immediately send him down to Providence. If he proves that he can be a guy that can be a 200 foot guy, a dependable player that can play maybe some PK. Um, adds a little bit more offense to his game. Uh, he, I think he has a real shot at unseating someone like Nosek. I don't think it's safe by any means that Nosek's like, all right, well, it's clear they want to give Felino another look uh, and maybe with a clean bill of health, he can be more than what he was last year, especially. But if Beecher pushes, I don't think it's like, well, Nosek's been in the league for a while. Like We can't do that. Uh, if, if Beecher looks like he's ready or they want to start him up there, I don't think it's going to hold him back. I'd way rather see Beecher up there. I would. And again, it's the thing against Nosek. It's that Beecher's your first round pick. He's He has this potential. You want to play kids. There aren't a lot of spots to do so. That's a guy who could potentially be up there. And also, by the way, like I know his, and we both agree that, you know, we don't really see him blossoming into this, you know, 20 goal a year guy, but he's a former NTDP kid. He played at Michigan. Like, He's always been very good. And I just think he's been, he's been on the lower end of the really good elite players at every level he's been at. But as, as we both said, like it could translate to a very good pro 200 foot game. Um, and the signs are there that that could happen. So um, it'll be an interesting matchup to watch uh, throughout training camp, a kind of an underrated one, but I would love to see him be ready enough that he could fit in as the fourth line center come opening night. Cause I mean, again, has the tools big fast. I mean, there's not many guys who are that big who can move that well. And I mean, I remember his first development camp, I think it was 2019 dude was flying out there. Um, and again, I mean, that was a couple of years ago now, but I mean, the speed is still very much there and it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, Connor, what can the people look forward to from you over at Boston sports journal, as well as the Bruins ringside YouTube channel? Yeah, we're going to have you covered every step of the way throughout training camp and into the regular season all the way through hopefully June. Um, we'll have uh, daily updates on training camp, the roster battles, uh, what guys like Jim Montgomery say about the state of the roster, stock watch, all that stuff, highlights from, from practice. We'll have you covered every step of the way, be it written uh, reports, video uh, breakdowns, all that stuff will be over at Boston Sports Channel and the Bruins Ringside YouTube channel, which we're going to try to, I think, roll out a lot of daily content moving forward to keep you informed on very much every channel of media out there. So please follow both. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter as well, do that at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Go do all that. That's Connor Ryan. I'm Evan Maranofsky. Poke the Bear listeners. Have a great rest.
of your of your week.